I've seen this story repeated many times. The doctors have all given up on a patient. There's nothing more we can do, they say. That's when many turn to the claims and promises of those who believe they can heal without medicine. But do miracle healings really happen today? A good many Christians can testify that God has touched them. There are hundreds and thousands of documented healings that even the doctors would concede are miraculous. Today we want to look at one healing account from the New Testament and what it can teach us about divine healing in the 21st century. That New Testament story I want to examine concerns a boy who behaved in an uncontrolled demonic way. The disciples of Jesus were embarrassed because they had totally failed to deliver and heal the boy. So the disciples came to Jesus privately in Matthew 17 and they asked, why couldn't we cast out that demon? And Jesus' answer still applies to anybody today who may feel frustrated about the subject of divine healing. Jesus said to his disciples, you couldn't cast out a demon because of your little faith. He also indicated that more prayer and fasting was needed on their part. That's also Jesus' challenge to all of his followers today. Difficult, obstinate cases should inspire us to increase our faith. In Matthew 17 and 19, Jesus' disciples came to him with their tails tucked between their legs, so to speak, humiliated because they had not been able to heal that boy who was described in the New King James as an epileptic. This case was particularly perplexing to them because Jesus had already given them power and authority to heal people and to cast out devils, and they had enjoyed a certain measure of success. Jesus had sent them out two by two on missions, and they had come back rejoicing that even demons were subject to them. That is, until this particular case. For all of us, there seems to be limits to our faith boundaries and not much has changed in the sorry state of the church in 2,000 years, except that today, unbelieving believers no longer even ask the Lord, why couldn't we drive out a demon? That's because most churchgoers and most professing believers won't even acknowledge that the, denom that the demonic realm is real. The debate goes on and on, for example, over the subject can a Christian have a demon? A true born-again believer cannot be demon-possessed, but he or she can be demon-oppressed. In other words, we can be attacked, and we can be oppressed from time to time by dark spirits if we don't know how to put on the armor of God and how to engage in spiritual warfare of which this world's atmosphere is full. So in Matthew 17 and verse 19, the disciples asked Jesus, why couldn't we drive out the demon? The Syriac and Persic versions of the New Testament render this verse, why couldn't we heal him? You see, this is a classic case of what comes first, the chicken or the egg. In some cases, healing will not result until first a demon is discerned and then cast out in the name of Jesus. Healing results only after the expulsion of the demon. So this verse definitely teaches us that some healings will never happen until the cause, a demon, is exposed and driven out. The father of the boy came to Jesus and he kneeled to Jesus and he explained, whenever the demon seizes my son, it throws him to the ground. 
He foams at the mouth, he gnashes his teeth, and he becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to drive out the Spirit, but they simply couldn't do it. Jesus' response shows his sorrow. Jesus was quite exasperated. He replied to all of those around, You unbelieving generation, how, how long must I stay with you and put up with you? He upbraided them because of the length of time he'd already been with them, and he'd already done so many wonderful works and miracles, and yet they remained unbelieving and incorrigible. Bring the boy to me, Jesus said. And that's what all parents should do. I think that teaches us that we should take our children and their infirmities to Jesus. And when the Spirit saw Jesus, it immediately threw the boy into a violent convulsion again, making him foam at the mouth and roll around on the ground. As this pitiful scene was unfolding, the father desperately explained that this had been going on since the boy's childhood. Can you believe how awful that must have been? He said the demon often tried to throw the child into the water or kill him by throwing him into fire. He begged Jesus. He said, if you can do anything, take pity and help us. But it's interesting to me in the Gospel of Mark, in chapter 9 and verse 23, Jesus turns the question around on the boy's father. If I can, Jesus said, you mean if you can, all things are possible to him who believes. The father immediately responded, I do believe. Help me to overcome my unbelief. That was a brilliantly honest answer. If only people in the church would be this transparent with God. Help me to overcome my unbelief. Well, demons love attention, and attention is a form of worship for them. They, they crave worship. So a crowd was gathering, and the demon was enjoying this wicked display. So Jesus soundly rebuked the unclean spirit, and Jesus nailed the spirit. I want you to note that Jesus specifically commanded what he called a deaf in a mute spirit to come out of the boy. In identifying that spirit, Jesus was demonstrating the gift of the discerning of spirits. Well, the spirit shrieked, it convulsed the boy again and departed, leaving the boy collapsed in a heap and no doubt exhausted, looking like a corpse because the crowd thought the boy was dead. What a scene, and we've seen similar scenes in our gospel meetings, and the spirits must be commanded not only to let the people go, but also to stop masquerading sometimes as a spirit of death. A woman collapsed in one of our meetings in Cairo after being tormented by a demon, and she appeared to be dead, and the demon was holding her down as if dead, as if she were out for the count. But we commanded her in the name of Jesus to get up, and hallelujah, she did. While the people in the Bible account thought that the boy collapsed at the feet of Jesus was dead, but Jesus simply took the boy by the hand and lifted him up, and the boy stood up right away. Jesus got the job done. And so the disciples came to him privately to find out why they had failed. But to encourage his disciples that they had not lost the power to perform miracles, Jesus said, if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, which is the least of all of the seeds, you can remove mountains and nothing will be impossible for you. The borders of our faith should be when nothing is impossible because of our confidence in the greatness of our God. I want to show you this is a little bottle of mustard seeds. Can you see this? And this was given to me by the South African farmer and man of faith, Angus Buchan. 
Angus gave me this little bottle when he and I were both speakers in Jerusalem at the Feast of Tabernacles. And I want you to see how tiny are these seeds. Jesus is saying we can move mountains with little itty bitty seeds like these. So why do we doubt? We don't have to have Superman or Superwoman faith. These mustard seeds should encourage us that we don't have to be faith giants in order to get results. But we do need to start exercising our little faith in God and making it grow. You see, our worst enemy in the church today is unbelief. God expects us to believe Him and His promises and then to act upon them. I like the book of Acts in the New Testament because its title describes faith action. Thank God it's not called the book of apathy, but the book of action of the apostles. The title of the book of Acts comes from a Greek word often used in early Christian literature to describe the exploits of the apostles. The title Acts or exploits of the apostles accurately reflects the contents of the book, which chronicles the lives of key apostles, especially Peter and Paul, in the decades immediately following the Lord's ascension into heaven. Faith and trust in God are what separated the men from the boys in the Bible. But in today's society, we must resist the unbelief that surrounds us and wants to kill our faith. For example, you may have biblical faith to believe God to heal you of a disease. But along come unbelieving family members and close, well-meaning friends. And if you don't resist their advice, they will drive you over the cliff of unbelief. Most of us live in families or communities consisting of well-meaning, even believers, but unbiblical believers. Unless you pay them no heed, they'll push, push, push you to go to the doctors or go to the hospital because of their own fears and unbelief. They'll insist that you put yourself in the hands of doctors to have some tests. Now, don't misunderstand me. I'm not against the medical world. I have to make a disclaimer here and say that there are wonders available in the world of medicine today. And I praise God for all of the medical advances that have helped so many people. Here in Israel, for example, they've come out with a bionic eye that helps people to gain their sight. But in this program, we're speaking of developing biblical faith. And I have to tell you that medical tests often can stir up and strengthen devils and even open the door for Satan to anchor a sickness in your body with a diagnosis rather than just taking your case to Jehovah Rophe, the Lord our healer. Also in countries like America where people watch inordinate amounts of TV and where sicknesses are regularly advertised on TV for medicines, it's difficult to maintain a biblical faith in God. And in countries like Britain and Israel where there's socialized medicine, God is often not first in the minds of people for healing. Well, how was the epileptic boy healed in the biblical account? Please notice with me that in Matthew 17 and verse 18, Jesus rebuked the devil and the unclean spirit came out of the boy and he was able to be restored after the spirit was expelled. Unfortunately, I believe that 99.999% of people in the church don't even think to rebuke an evil spirit because they're simply not trained to think and to act biblically. When, for example, was the last time you heard somebody rebuke a devil? You see, the church has apostatized to the point that most unbelieving believers don't even believe that demons exist. 
And priests who exorcise devils are either mocked or depict by central casting in the movies as stereotypes of fanaticism. But I heard a Baptist deacon say, do you know how long it took me to learn to rebuke the devil? The thought had never crossed his mind to cast out a demon because his Baptist church didn't teach such things. But as he began to study this word of God, it became very clear that Jesus, our Lord and Master, gave his followers the power to cast out demons. And now that Baptist deacon has one of the most powerful, sincere healing ministries in the world today because he decided to follow Jesus and his methods. Jesus said there were two reasons for the failure of his disciples. Reason number one, he said, that they couldn't cast out the evil spirit was because of their unbelief, or literally, the text says, because of their little faith. And secondly, Jesus taught a harsh reality that this kind of stubborn spirit only comes out because of a believer's consecration to God by devoting extra time and energy to prayer and fasting. So a casual believer who's not exercised his faith and who has never prayed or fasted to be able to deliver people from tormenting spirits is not a likely candidate to get the job done. Jesus clearly thought, taught in this episode that some evil spirits are more obstinate than others, and they're not easily evicted when they've had a long tenure. Jesus taught elsewhere, specifically in Matthew chapter 12 and verse 45, that some demons are worse and more wicked than others. For sure, I've learned in my many years as a believer and minister and from the study of God's Word that there are different degrees and even ranks in the satanic hierarchy. So in Matthew 12, 45, Jesus said that when an unclean spirit has gone out of a man, it walks through dry places seeking rest and it finds none. And then it will attempt to return to the person, but it will take seven other spirits more wicked than itself and when they gain re-entry, the man is worse off than he was previously. When Jesus sighed and cried over this case, he said, Oh, you perverse generation. How long am I going to have to put up with you? He was thinking, Am I the only one who has faith to deal with this? I'll have to, to deliver the boy because my disciples just aren't up to speed yet. Jesus clearly was saying that it's a perverse and perverted generation that doesn't know how to deal with demons. Think about that. Furthermore, in this episode in Matthew 17, Jesus gave us those two important keys for anybody who's serious with God. He said, but an evil spirit of this kind is only driven out by prayer and fasting. So this verse teaches us that we simply must ask the Holy Spirit to show us how to set aside some time and how long to fast in order to deal successfully with dark powers. I like Matthew Henry's commentary on this passage in Matthew 17 because it encourages parents to take afflicted children to the Lord for a cure. The case of afflicted children should always be presented to God by faithful and fervent prayer. Our Messiah indeed cured the boy and he's the same today as he was yesterday. Though the people were perverse, the Messiah was clearly provoked at their little faith not at the child. He was faithful to take care of the child. So when all other help fails, we may trust in the goodness and the power of Messiah, whom we should have consulted in the first place. This gospel episode surely encourages us as parents always to bring our children and our grandchildren to Messiah 
and he is willing and he is able to break strongholds. The grip of Satan must not ever discourage our faith, but we must apprehend that Messiah's power is infinitely greater. Though all things are possible, some works are just more difficult to accomplish than others. And that's why Jesus recommended fasting. Remember, the apostles had already been sent out as preachers by Jesus and that exercised successfully their power over devils without any special prayer or fasting up to that point. And they had come back to Jesus rejoicing that the devils had been subject to them. But this time, the word of exorcism spoken in the name of Jesus, spoken with little faith, didn't get the job done. So they were learning that in order to be successful exorcists, they were going to need more time and more special prayer and faith and fasting, more preparation. So we learn from this that fasting subdues the flesh and it increases the spirit of revelation. By means of prayer and fasting, a believer is open to receive greater power from on high to withstand greater assaults of the evil one. It's interesting that Jesus clearly said through the gift of the discerning of spirits that the boy had a deaf and a mute spirit. Now the account of the same incident in the Gospel of Mark chapter 9, 17 identifies the evil spirit as one that made the boy speechless. However, in the Gospel of Matthew, the boy is called in the King James language, a lunatic. And in more modern episodes, the word is epileptic, but the original means to be moonstruck, supposedly influenced by the moon, waxing and waning of the moon, and some translations, as I said, render the word as epilepsy. So let's look at this whole topic from another angle for a moment, mental illness. Today the word lunatic means someone who's mentally ill. The boy specifically was told that he, uh, were told that he was speechless and so through all of the antics that the devil put him through, he probably looked deranged. And mental illness is increasingly a problem in our world of stress, uncertainties, and because of side effects from high-powered drugs that cause people sometimes to go crazy and commit suicide or murder. I read a question and answer column written by an Orthodox rabbi. A man suffering from depression wrote that he felt seriously mentally ill and because of that he, he felt worthless and he said the hospital treatments were not doing anything for him. The man said, I'm just a worthless human being. And as I read this, I thought to myself, how many people feel just like that? The man wrote that he didn't get any relief from the hospital treatments. He said, Dear Rabbi, I'm a wretch. My whole family are wretches. And the man went on and on, bemoaning his failure in life while all of his school friends were successful. They teach Torah. They're rabbis. They're educators. He said, While well, I'm still just a dish rag. I even study Torah several hours a day, but then I forget it all due to the medicine and the treatments. He ended the letter by asking woefully, what am I worth? Well, I love the rabbi's answer. He was very wise and compassionate. And he said that, first of all, we must determine man's purpose on earth. Is it to be a Torah scholar? Is it to be somebody important and admired by everybody? Is our purpose to have a high status in life? No. Man's purpose, the rabbi said, is to serve God. He said we're created for the sole purpose of rejoicing in God and deriving pleasure from the splendor of his presence. As I read the rabbi's statement, I remembered that it agreed with the Westminster Catechism that I learned 
from my own father, a Presbyterian minister of blessed memory. The first question of the Westminster Shorter Catechism asks, what is the chief end or purpose of man? And the answer is, the chief end of man is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. Amen. You see, the master of the universe is not an achievement-oriented elitist. Rather, he appreciates the efforts we make. For example, in the book of Ruth in the Old Testament, when Naomi saw what an effort Ruth made to go with Naomi to Bethlehem, she ceased arguing with her. And so the rabbi said, you've been faithfully toiling in the Word of God. He told the man that surely in the world to come, there'll be many surprises. People who are considered important and who are celebrated here on this earth will be considered worthless in the world to come. And many people who are derided here will be highly important in the world to come. So do your best, the rabbi advised, and always be aware that you're precious in God's sight. But in this gospel age, God does expect us to trust the Lord for healing of our bodies, souls, and minds because of all that Jesus, Yeshua is his Hebrew name, suffered, and for all that he accomplished for us on the cross. And so we mustn't waste the atonement of Yeshua. How many in the churches today say emphatically, I'm going to trust the Lord for my healing and for my mental stability? Many tragically think that Jesus is just not sufficient, that somehow he needs help with chemo or other mind-altering drugs for depression. Well, it does take perseverance and faith to live here on this earth because we're living in suits of dust. And sometimes we make the mistake of thinking that faith is the equivalent of great, great exploits. But remember the tiny mustard seed. The whole law in the Old Testament is summarized in just one verse, and that's Habakkuk 2.4. The just shall live by his faith. And that verse is quoted in the New Testament several times that we are to live by our faith and not to shrink back. Well, I hope that this teaching has been helpful to you and that if you want to watch it again, you can go to our website at www.exploits.tv and we can study together again this whole matter of faith and at the website you can learn about our Holy Land conferences and how to receive our free ministry magazine exploits. Until next time I'm Christine Darig encouraging you to call upon the name of the Lord while there's yet time for the Bible says, if you'll call on the name of Jesus, you shall be saved. And don't forget to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Shalom. Thank you for watching the Jerusalem channel. We appreciate so much your comments and questions that you're sending to us by email. Currently, we have over 100 videos available for you free of charge at the Jerusalem channel, and there are many more to come because the Jerusalem Channel is a faith-based charity made possible by you. If you're in the United States, please know that your gifts to the Jerusalem Channel are tax deductible. And if you're in the UK or anywhere else in the world, we also need your support. As a watchman upon these walls of Jerusalem, you are encircling the city of the great king with your prayers and also the Jerusalem channel. Out of Zion, I'm Christine Darg, blessing you.